From Chapter 4 of The State in Capitalist Society by Ralph Miliband As we have noted earlier, there have been occasions in the political life of advanced capitalist countries when ultimate executive power has come into the hands of social democratic governments whose political commitments appeared to range them against their traditional and business elites. Save in the case of the Scandinavian countries, such occasions have been fairly infrequent. Much more commonly, governmental coalitions have at one time or another included in prominent positions and in substantial numbers social democratic ministers, and even, as in the case of France, Italy and Belgium after the Second World War, communist ones. It is, therefore, necessary to examine how far such episodes affect the general proposition advanced above, that despite appearances to the contrary, executive power in the world of advanced capitalism has never, in fact, held any serious threat to the prevailing economic system and to its main beneficiaries. Before proceeding with this, however, it is necessary to consider an entirely different experience, namely that of the fascist regimes in Italy and Germany, where de classe adventurers, one of them a revolutionary socialist in his early days, and both full of anti-capitalist and anti-bourgeois rhetoric, proclaimed it as their purpose to effect the total transformation of their societies, and held what may properly be described as absolute power for a good many years. How far, it may well be asked, does this experience qualify or negate the notion of fundamental congruity on the foundations of society between state power and capitalist interests? The answer, it may be said at once, is not at all. In the light of the evidence, the point would hardly need much argument, were it not for the fact that the economic and social reality of fascism is now so often ignored or obscured. The fascist rhetoric of total transformation and renewal with its anti-bourgeois resonances, is obviously important, if only because the fascist leaders could not, without it, have acquired a mass following. Nor is it to be doubted that many of them believed with utter conviction that they were engaged on the creation of an entirely new social order. The reality, however, was altogether different from their grandiose elucubrations, and they themselves approached their task with the absolutely firm determination not to attack the basic framework of that capitalist system they often reviled. As Mussolini told his Senate on the 13th of January 1934, more than ten years after he had assumed power, the corporative economy respects the principle of private property. Private property completes the human personality. It is a right, but it is also a duty. We think that property ought to be regarded as a social function. We wish, therefore, to encourage not passive property but active property, which does not confine itself to enjoying wealth, but develops it and increases it. The cooperative economy respects private initiative. The Charter of Labour expressly states that only when private initiative is unintelligent, non-existent or inefficient may the state intervene. This at least was one line of policy to which the Italian dictator held unswervingly. As for Germany, one student of Nazism notes that In the confidential conversations which culminated in his speech to the captains of the Ruhr Industries on the 27th of January 1932, Hitler revised the economic programme of the NSDAP. He had previously conceded to the small firms that his party supported private property, but he was now extending his policy by largely adopting the ideas of big business. He argued for the elimination of unions and for the managerial freedom of employers with concerns. He outlined his programme of public works and rearmament, which would lead to recovery and to many orders for business concerns. These public orders would not have the effect of delegating more economic functions to the government, since the leaders of big business were to be given the task of directing the economy through the economic organisations under their control. Hitler also promised a stable government that would stay in power for a long time. And the same author also notes that, taken into his confidence, leading businessmen trusted Hitler and convinced themselves that the party, once in power, would provide big business with the opportunity to determine the economic policy of his government. These leading businessmen who financed and supported Hitler, together with many other elements of Germany's traditional elites, as their Italian equivalents had done for Mussolini, did not make a dupe's bargain. Hitler and his colleagues had not entered into alliance with them in bad faith, the better to accomplish once in power 
a revolutionary and anti-capitalist purpose. There was no such purpose. And those among his followers who thought there was, and who constituted the left wing of Nazism, soon paid with their lives for their mistake. Vigorous encouragement of private enterprise, another recent writer notes, was one of the programmatic points Hitler presented to the Reichstag in March 1933. One such encouragement, of immense importance to any kind of assessment of the fascist regimes, was of course the physical destruction of all working-class defence organisations, parties, unions, cooperatives, their ancillary organisations, their press, their parliamentary representation, and the creation of new controlling bodies dominated by employers and the state. Had they done nothing else, the fascist dictators, by the subjugation of all manifestations of working-class power and influence, would have richly earned the gratitude of employers, and of the economically dominant classes generally. As Salvamini aptly puts it, a socialist state would nationalise capital on the ground that it is redeeming the worker from the slavery of wages. The fascist state has nationalised labour and hires it out to private capital at the price that it, the state, deems expedient. In so doing, these regimes also earned the gratitude of millions of wage earners who found employment on such terms preferable to no employment at all. But their gratitude and support does not affect the point that the fascist conquest of power entailed an immediate and dramatic increase in the power of capital over labour. It was, after all, no small thing that workers who fostered class conflict were usually handed over without ceremony to the Gestapo, and that workers were now legally required to show absolute obedience and loyalty to their leader, who was in turn required to care for their welfare. This leader was the employer, and complaints against his failure to look after his workers' welfare could easily be construed as fostering class conflict. No wonder that net profits rose by 433% between the beginning of 1933 and the end of 1936, and that, as Mr Schoenbaum notes, while wages remained static and even fell slightly between 1934 and 1940, the average net income of income taxpayers, and thus of managerial and entrepreneurial business, rose by 46%. Until the war, German business had only German workers to exploit. German victory delivered into its hands millions of slave labourers from occupied Europe, who were even more helpless vis-à-vis their employers than their German counterparts. Of course, business under fascism had to submit to a far greater degree of state intervention and control than it liked, and there was no doubt a good deal about the state's economic and social policies which it found disagreeable. But businessmen themselves played a major role in the system of regulation and control, which was no small compensation. So much so, it has to be said that, to the very end of the Nazi dictatorship, the business leaders retained perhaps more power than any other elite group besides the Nazi bosses. Nor should it be overlooked that the Nazi bosses included many people who were themselves members of the business and bourgeois classes. Corporate entrepreneurs and managers, skilled in industrial production and administration, the bureaucrats, skilled in interpreting the codified rules of the game and applying them to concrete situations, the industrial engineers and other technologists skilled in applying knowledge to specific social goals. More generally, a substantial part of that Nazi elite was not only middle class, but distinctly upper class, with a notable number of high-ranking officers. It is often said that fascism is an extreme example of the state's domination of society. This is quite true, but the formula, in that it lacks social content, is misleading in two senses. First, in the sense that it obscures the degree to which the fascist state acted in ways enormously advantageous to the business and possessing classes, but also secondly, because it fails to take into account the fact that the state continued to be largely manned by people who belonged to the traditional administrative, military and judicial elites. Indeed, the Nazi regime seems to have reversed the trend towards the democratisation of the state system, which had been a feature of the Weimar regime. There were, for instance, more aristocrats in positions of power between 1933 and 1945 than between 1918 and 1933, and fewer people of working class origin. Ultimate power of an absolute kind was in the hands of the dictators, but they had, perforce, to devolve a great deal of that power upon others. All in all, the evidence shows 
that the people concerned were not likely to harbour thoughts in any way dangerous to the established economic and social order. In any case, all members of the fascist state system were expected to subscribe with absolute loyalty to a body of ideas which, however hollow it might be in other respects, excluded clearly and emphatically any attack on the basic framework of capitalism. Not only were dangerous thoughts not likely to be found among the men who came and went in the corridors of fascist power, such thoughts were positively forbidden. Taboo. But the most telling fact of all about the real nature of the fascist systems is surely that, when they came to an end, twenty years after Mussolini's march on Rome and twelve years after Hitler's assumption of the chancellorship, the economic and social structure of both countries had not been significantly changed. The classes which occupied the higher reaches of the economic and social pyramid before the fascists came to power were still there, and so was the capitalist system which sustained these classes. Well might Franz Neumann state that the essence of national socialist social policy consists in the acceptance and strengthening of the prevailing class character of German society. Exactly the same was true of Italy. At the same time, it is also true that the privileged classes in both Italy and Germany had to pay a high political price for the immense advantages which were conferred upon them by the fascist regimes. For while they retained many positions of power and influence, they had to submit to a dictatorship over which they had no genuine control at all. Having helped the dictators to rob all other classes, and notably the working classes, of any semblance of power, they found their own drastically curtailed and in some crucial areas, notably foreign policy, altogether nullified. This is not a situation which an economically and socially dominant class, however secure it may feel about the ultimate intentions of its rulers, can contemplate without grave qualms, since it introduces into the process of decision-making, to which its members have been used to make major contribution, an extremely high element of unpredictability. It is in this perspective that must be understood the notion of the independence of the state power from all forces in civil society, to which Marx and Engels occasionally referred as possible in exceptional circumstances, and of which fascism, in the context of advanced capitalism, may be said to provide the furthest example. In that context, however, the concept is ambiguous, in that it suggests a certain neutrality on the part of the state power in regard to social forces which actual experience belies. Marx himself, writing of the coup d'état of Louis Bonaparte, suggested that only under the second Bonaparte does the state seem to have made itself completely independent. The struggle seems to be settled in such a way that all classes, equally impotent and equally mute, fall on their knees before the rifle butt. But Marx also noted in a famous phrase that the state power is not suspended in mid-air, and that Louis Napoleon's main task, his mission, was to safeguard bourgeois order. This is also a valid description of the mission of the fascist dictators. Nor was it the case in Italy and Germany that all classes were equally impotent and mute under fascism. What is true, however, is that the dictators, while working to safeguard the capitalist order, whatever their rhetoric and revolutionary reforms, were also extremely well placed to determine on their own how they would do so, and to take decisions of crucial national importance quite independently. It is the fear of such a situation arising, which helps, inter alia, to explain why some elements of the business and traditional elites in Italy and Germany viewed the rise to power of their respective fascist movements with unease and even hostility. Those who supported fascism, and indeed made its accession to power possible, thought that they would buy the services of political gangsters without being dominated by them. In this, they were mistaken. For a long time all went well and they found little to complain about as Mussolini and Hitler marched from success to success, at home and in diplomacy and in war. The gamble appeared to have succeeded. But then came the threat of terrible retribution. For defeat in war and the collapse of the fascist regimes raised the spectre of social revolution, which they had sought to exorcise once and for all by surrendering their fate to the fascists. In Italy the threat came from within, in Germany from without in the train of the advancing Russian armies. However, the Italian and German privileged classes, having lost their fascist masters and protectors, now found a new set of protectors in the shape of their British and American conquerors and occupiers. 
The Western powers were unable to do much about the post-war settlement in Eastern Europe, but they had no intention whatever of allowing radical social change in any country where they did have power to shape events, i.e. Western Europe, Greece, Japan, and indeed everywhere else save Eastern Europe. Occupation by the armies of the United States and Britain amounted in effect to an absolute guarantee that the existing economic and social structures would be preserved, and that any internal threat to them would be opposed, if necessary, with the full force of military power as in Greece. Indeed, defeat at the hands of the Western Allies provided an additional bonus to the Italian, German and Japanese capitalist classes. It rid them of political rulers whose failure in war had turned them into encumbrances, which those classes were too weak or too craven to remove themselves. It did appear, at the end of the war, that anti-fascism, denazification and the purge of compromised elites, might push democratisation rather too far and make the return of some of these elites to positions of power and influence impossible. Similarly, there was much that was repugnant to German and Japanese business in the policies of decartelization upon which the victorious powers seemed bent. But all fears that defeat might have really drastic and irremediable consequences for the entrenched classes of the countries concerned were soon assuaged. The artificial revolution, as one writer has called the changes which were forced upon Germany and Japan at the end of the war, brought no permanent stigma to those who had led their country to ruin. Neither country emerged into sovereignty with any important reservations against the employment of nationalist fanatics of the 30s and 40s, even in the most responsible positions. What most opponents of Hitler in Germany wanted, the same writer suggests, perhaps unfairly to what there remained in 1945 of an authentic German socialist left, was a form of palace revolution, involving the return of older elites in place of the Nazi upstarts. This is in fact what occurred, and Japanese experience was not materially different. In both countries, shifts in the power structure occurred mainly within a middle and upper class context, and did not significantly affect middle and upper class predominance. As for decartelization, it was never more than a tentative and half-hearted affair, and such efforts as were made to carry it out were correspondingly abortive. A few years after the war, big business in the defeated countries was bigger than ever, and launched on a spectacular course of expansion, and businessmen in both Germany and Japan had achieved a position in society more exalted than at any time previously. At the same time, the post-war triumphs of capitalism in Germany, Japan and Italy were hardly a case of the phoenix rising from the ashes. The phoenix had been alive and prospering throughout the years of dictatorship and terror. Defeat at the hands of the Western powers merely gave it the chance to do even better. For the business and other elites of these countries, those years were not a dark hiatus between overthrow and restoration. There was no overthrow, and there was therefore no need for restoration.